Good morning, family. Good to see all of you. If you're joining us online, good morning to you. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, my name, as she said, is Adam McKeldry. I get to serve here as the associate pastor. It's an honor to be on staff here. I thought I could start briefly just, uh, you know, give you guys an update on how Josh is doing. I know many of you probably are wondering. We've thrown some out there over social media and stuff over the last week. He's doing good, as good as can be expected. I got to visit with him on Friday in person and for about an hour. He was his usual chipper self and making jokes. And he's been working hard all week to, to make all the milestones that he needs to so that they will kick him out of there. And uh, they did that. They kicked him out yesterday. So he got to go home. <clears throat> but yeah, that's awesome. It's amazing to me that you can be out of the hospital that quick after such a major surgery. But I know he's still not getting very good sleep because he texted me at 4, thir- or four o'clock this morning <laughs> telling me he was praying for me about today. So thank you guys for all your prayers and your support over the last week for Josh and for his family. You know, I mentioned it yes, or last week <clears throat> uh, about how excited and proud I am to be a part of this family. You guys are awesome. And some of you may not know, but our family actually extends over into Pullman. Um, We have a sister church over there, Real Life Church in Pullman. We launched them out on their own back in 2020, of all years. Uh, And they've been doing great. Um, But uh, we've been trying to keep connected with them as best as we can over the last three years and doing things like the, the youth camp. Our two youth groups do that together. Our, the, so the youth kids from the Pullman and our kids will be going to camp together. So that's pretty awesome. But one of the other ways that we got to, to help out one another is to just step in when we're in need. Like last summer, when they were in the middle of a leadership transition, we were able to send some of our key volunteers over to help lead worship for them and to, to teach on Sunday. Um, <clears throat> and they're going to do the same for us. Uh, you know, next week, Josh was supposed to be up here and to teach on the helmet of salvation, but something about getting your chest split open, you know, he might not be ready to go by next week. So I reached out to our family over in Pullman and said, hey, would you guys be willing to help out? And without hesitation, they said, absolutely. So next week, I'm really excited. We get to have uh, Pullman's new senior <clears throat> pastor who just started a couple months ago. His name is Kelly Van Arsdahl. He's going to come over and he's going to share with us and teach on the helmet of salvation. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, We do indeed have a really, really awesome church family. Thank you guys for all being a part of that. Um, Let's see. So the last three weeks, we've been working on the armor of God. And we've been looking at Ephesians 6 where we find Paul introduced this idea of God's armor that he gives to all of us as followers of him. So I want to start our time together today by first going to Ephesians 6 and rereading what Paul writes to that church in Ephesus. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll want to come over to me, come over with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And we are going to start reading in verse 10. Here's what God's word says. He says, finally... Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I'm sure you've noticed those three pieces of armor that we've already talked about, the belt of truth, 
the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes which are the gospel of peace that we throw onto our feet. Now one of the things that we have mentioned along the way here with these first three things is that these are three things that we need to have on us at all times. We must have truth and righteousness and readiness from the gospel of peace about us all the time. And I hope that over the last three weeks, as you guys have been thinking about God's armor that he's given to us, as you've been talking about it, some of you in your life groups that are still meeting this summer, maybe just around your, your table at home, like, I hope that you are seeing why it is so imperative, why we believe it's so important that these are three things that we put on each and every day. How vital it is for us as followers of Jesus to begin our day by wrapping ourselves in truthful living based on the truth that we find in Jesus so that we can be able to protect our most vulnerable places. To cover ourselves in righteousness, righteousness which is actions and thoughts founded in that same truth. Because when we do that, then we protect and guard our hearts. To use the traction that that uh, Ty talked about last week, that we get from the gospel of peace by knowing who Jesus is and who we are in him. The gospel that gives us the ability to stand firm against our enemy. When we start each and every day by putting those three things on every day, we become not much of a target. We're no longer easy targets. But we are in a spiritual battle. Paul believes it, Jesus believed it, I believe it, we are in a spiritual battle. And just because we're not easy targets does not mean that we will not be attacked. And that is why God has given us the other three elements to the armor of God. The first one that Paul mentioned that we are gonna talk about today, spend the rest of the time exploring, is found in verse 16. So let's throw it back up here and I'll read it again. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith. I can remember, I grew up in the church, and I can remember as I thought about this shield of faith, I always pictured, you know, like uh, a medieval knight standing there with a, a little nice light shield that was great to to fend people off and maybe use as a weapon sometimes. And that shield was based on my personal faith, my personal belief on who Jesus was. Maybe some of you grew up with the same thought. But as I have grown in my faith walk, and as I have, especially in the last couple weeks, I've just been really challenged about what is the shield of faith I don't know that I was on the right track. And I hope that as you guys leave today, after we spend our time going over the shield of faith, that maybe you too will be challenged in your thought process, your understanding of what this shield of faith that Paul talks about might actually be. So let's first look at the shield. So remember, we are talking about the shield. There we go. We're probably talking about a Roman uh, soldier's shield because this is most likely the shield that Paul would have seen on a daily basis. Remember, Rome is the preeminent power in the known world. And so you're going to see Roman legionnaires all over the place. And so Paul would have most likely been talking about a shield like this. I got a picture for you guys up here. This, This is a picture of the one and only surviving Roman shield that has been found in archaeology, which is shocking, right? Well, when I tell you what, what this thing was, how this was constructed, it won't be that shocking. So this is just a replica, right? Somebody pounded some tin together and painted it kind of poorly. But it's, it's shorter than what an actual shield would have been. An actual shield probably would have been about another foot, foot and a half tall. Four feet usually, ish, was how tall they were. And they weren't constructed of metal like this. They were actually constructed of wood. 
And they would take all these different planks of wood and they would glue them get together, fasten them together. And that's why, you know, to have one survive over centuries is pretty miraculous. But as they did that, as they fastened these, shield, these pieces of wood together, they were able to create this curve to the shield. I don't know if you guys can tell, there's a curve to this shield. And it was very, uh, this was not something that you saw normally in shields. Now there's a couple of reasons why they did it this way. One, if you think about taking a blow from an arrow or a sword or a rock that is thrown, if it hits this thing, it's most likely going to just glance off. So the design was perfect to help absorb, you know, to shoot some of that energy from an attack off to the side and the soldier wouldn't take the whole thing. But the thing that was most impressive about this shield, because it was big, it was heavy, it was not really designed for, you know, single combat. But the thing that was most impressive about this is how they actually used it as an army. They would use it in what is called a testudo formation. I got a picture for you guys up here of what that looks like. They would take these shields, the front guys would dig them into the ground as hard as they could. They would be sticking behind it. And then everybody would be lining up beside them. And they would form this shell. Testudo means tortoise in Latin. And all the shields would overlap. So that my shield would overlap with the guy next to me and so forth and so forth. And so we were this impenetrable force of protection for the army. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind this, this picture of the testudo, because we're going to come back to it. But I want to move on to what Paul says that this shield represents, faith. Now, I, I mentioned it before. Uh, for me, when I thought about what Paul was talking about, uh, with regards to this shield being a shield of faith, I'd, I'd always assumed that it was a shield of my faith. Like the shield was dependent on what I knew and believed about God. You know, the confidence that I had in that information. And it was that that made the shield big and strong or not big and strong, and that's what I was supposed to use to defend myself from the arrows that the enemy would shoot at me. I don't feel that way anymore. Because honestly, if, if that is what Paul is meaning here, by the shield of faith, that it is a shield of my faith, then, faith, then I'm in trouble. Here's why I think I'm in trouble, and maybe some of you can, to re can relate to this. Life is hard. Life is hard, and there are a lot of things, hard things that come at us throughout the course of our lives. And those are kind of like the fiery arrows that are being shot at us, right? Those hard things. Sometimes those difficult situations that we face, they go our way. And we're like, that's great, that's awesome. Praise God. I think about what we have been through as a church in the last week with Josh. Like, praise God that it went the way that it did. Praise God that our prayers were answered as we lifted him up in prayer. I knew God was a healer, is a healer. I knew God could heal Josh. I knew God loved Josh. I believed that he would protect Josh through the surgery. And he did. You know, and it's scenarios like that that, for me, have always been easy to add to my faith. It's always been easy to bolster my faith and build that shield stronger because it went exactly as I thought it should. It went exactly as I told the God it should. But I've thought a lot this week about what if, what if it didn't? What if the surgery didn't go the way that I thought it should? 
what would that do to my faith? What would that have done to what I've decided to believe about who God is and how he feels about me? You know, right now I don't even honestly know how to answer that because I'm not sure. And that startles me. And it is especially frightening to me because I know what could happen. I saw a church back in Montana go through this years ago and we still lived there. It was one of the larger churches in the, in the area and their senior pastor got sick with term, uh, terminal illness. I think it was, might have been cancer. And uh, like it was, it was scary for the whole church and so they were a praying church too and they got on their knees and they prayed and they prayed and they believed that God was a God of healing. They believed that God would heal him and that he would stay here. But God did not heal him. And he passed away. And it was devastating for that church. It destroyed some people. The loss of their pastor just devastated them, not just because they were devastated by the loss of a friend and their pastor, but because they were also devastated by feeling let down by God, feeling like they didn't really know why he would do that. It shook the foundations of people's faith. Some some wondered if their faith was not strong enough. You know, maybe they, they just didn't believe hard enough. Maybe they just didn't have all the right information. They didn't they didn't pray the right way. Some people took it as a sign to To say this God thing was just not for them. If he could let this happen, I don't need to be a part of it. And they walked away from their faith. Their shield, those who who struggled through that in that way, their shield was made of their faith. And it failed them. It failed them to protect them from those arrows of grief and disappointment and doubt. And I know there have been seasons in my own life where I can confidently say that the shield of my faith was was like this big, strong Roman soldier, heavy, could withstand anything. Like I could go through anything in life, no matter what, whether it went my way or not, and I could stand firm and, and block those attacks. But I also know that there have been times in my life where This shield of my faith was more like a wet paper plate. And it wasn't stopping anything. Everything was getting through. Everything wounded me. Everything made me doubt and question my faith. And that was a dangerous place for me to be. And please hear me on this. I'm not not saying that it is a bad thing to to have questions about your faith, to have doubts about your faith, that's, I think that is a great thing. The danger is if you never ask those questions, if you never talk to somebody about those doubts that you have. Because our faith is not a a blind faith. We're not supposed to just take it without working it out. Our faith is one that we work for. So I don't believe that this shield that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6 actually is about our faith, my personal faith. I think there's something else. And I think the hint of what he might have been talking about is actually in the text. And I read over it a hundred times and never dawned on me until, you know, recently. And we read it today. This is the armor of who? God. It's not the armor of Adam. It's not the armor of you. This is the armor of God. So that means that there is some characteristic of God's faith, some attribute of him that Paul is trying to point to here. 
The second hint, and I, I didn't throw this in your notes or on the, on the board, but like the Greek word that is used here in Ephesians 6 and actually throughout the New Testament, usually when they're talking about faith, is the word pistis. And in Ephesians, it's translated as faith, but one of the other ways that it can be translated is faithfulness. Faithfulness. And I think what Paul was getting at is that this is not a fi- shield of, uh, of our faith, but it is a shield of God's faithfulness. And I want to take you to a couple of places in the text that I think is going to help us I hope help you come to the same conclusion that I have. And I want to start over in Hebrews chapter 11. Now Hebrews, if you don't know, this chapter is known as the, is the, chapter, the faith chapter. Like it's all about faith. And I, I would be remiss to skip ahead to the part that I want to show you guys uh, and, and skip the first verse because this, is, this verse is the only place in the entire text that you will see a clear definition of what faith is. So let's go to Hebrews 11. I'm going to read it off here because I'm using a version that we don't normally use. Now faith is the substance, uh, substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which were, are seen were not made of things which are visible. I, no, let's not go to there yet. I love what the translators chose to use here when they defined faith. Now think about how our world defines faith. It is a belief without proof. Right? You probably have family and friends who think you're crazy because you believe what you believe because they don't think there's proof and they don't think that you need proof. But that's not what faith is. Faith has evidence. Faith has substance. And it is only because of that that there is faith. Only because there is something to it. There is evidence of it. And as you continue to read through Hebrews 11, which I encourage you guys to do if you haven't in a while, like you start to see the author here draw that out as he shares stories, or she, he or she, whoever, or I don't know, nobody knows, writes this book and starts talking about all these people in the Old Testament that had faith. And I, the one I want to show you is in Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11, so let's put that up. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. She had experienced something along the way, probably more than once, because God called her and Abraham and, and all of his clan to leave the, his homeland to go to a promised land. If you read through Genesis in that story, you can see where all these little places where God shows up and he does things. He, he provides for Abraham. He provides for Sarah. They protect him. So she experienced all these things, things that we can read about, things that would probably aren't even in there, where she got to see how God was faithful faithful in his promises, faithful in in who he was. And she was able to look back at those things and she saw God's faithfulness. And because of that, because she knew and experienced God's faithfulness, she could act out out of that. She could live out her faith. And that is what faith is. She did something about it. And you'll see that throughout the rest of all those stories. Like they experienced with something with God. They knew who God was. They had the information. But they didn't just sit there with it. They did something. And it was commend, uh, commended for them as faith. Now I know, I know this one is like, 
a little loosey-goosey on connecting the whole shield of faith to God's faithfulness thing. But I wanted you guys to see first that our faith is not just a mental thing. It's not a mental decision. Like it, faith without action is dead. James talks about that too. But I wanted to just point that out to you guys before I take you to Psalm 91, which I want to go to next. This whole psalm is phenomenal, but I'm going to only read the first seven verses for you. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and his wings will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. This one's a little more obvious. His faithfulness is your shield. You will not fear the terror of the night. You will not fear the arrow that flies by day. This makes so much more sense to me. To look at the shield of faith in this way. To have a shield that is not dependent on my inconsistencies and doubts that I have sometimes about my faith and who I am and who God is. Like, man, that, that shield is not very strong but rather it's dependent on a God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, whose mercies are new every morning. There is no better shield available to us than a shield that is made up of God's faithfulness. It's God's faithfulness that protects us from those arrows those fiery arrows that Satan shoots at us. And those arrows are different for all of us. You know, maybe it's a thought that you have. Maybe it's a, a, a self-condemnation attitude that you're having. You're, 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 you're being tempted to, to rethink what truth might actually be. Not that we face that at all in our country today. But this shield, when we use this shield, when we recognize and see and remember how God is faithful and has been faithful in our lives and we look back and we see all those things and we can pick this up. And when those arrows come at us, we can use it. And we can shield off those fiery arrows. But... I mean, I'm human. I know there are times in our lives where trying to remember God's faithfulness is not that easy. There are times in our lives where it's not just like an arrow here or an arrow there coming at us, but we look up and the sky is blacked out with the arrows that are coming at us. And we forget that we even have this shield of God's faithfulness in front of us and we don't pick it up. Here's the great thing about this shield. This has never been designed or intended for you to shield off those arrows by yourself. Remember the testudo? Look at this picture again, guys. All of these soldiers are depending on one another to 
and be protected from an attack. I know there are times when it's, it's hard to remember God's faithfulness in your life, but that's why you have somebody beside you. Somebody beside you who tells you about God's faithfulness in their life, how he has showed up in their life and been consistent and faithful and trustworthy. How they can point you back to, to God's word and show you all the stories of how God was faithful in all of these lives from the beginning to the end. You can point to everybody else in the formation. Look at all these people. They, God has been faithful in their lives. And they can help you and remember when God has been faithful in your life. Man, I was there with you when God showed up. Remember when he did that for you? Remember when you thought you were at the end of your rope? Remember when you were questioning everything? God was faithful. And we can pick this shield up. And we protect not just ourselves, but those around us, because we are all using the same shield of God's faithfulness. And I think that's what Paul is talking about when he's talking about take up this shield of faith.